Thank you. Uh, before opening the floor to, to questions, uh, you will allow me to, to, to abuse my, my place as, as facilitator and ask the first question. So what's, the, um, so what's the bottom line? Why are Greek banks, and that's a question for all of you, are trading at 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3 their book, which, which is, you know, which is, it's very low even by the, you know, weak standards of the European banking sector. Is it because they're afraid uh, investors are afraid uh, uh, we're going to see a deja vu of the Greek drama we saw last year. Is it because they're losing money and they're having second thoughts about their investment last November? Is it because they think that uh, the, the framework put in place, uh, well, the you know, delays in putting in place a framework, a framework for uh, uh, managing NPLs uh, mean that uh, uh, banks cannot get rid of their stock of, uh, of uh, non-performing exposures. Uh, is it, you know, the, 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 the systemic framework, what's, if you were, if you were asked to give uh, one reason, at least, or uh, the most important reason for this, for, for the route, for the stock market route we've seen uh, over the past uh, couple of months, what would uh, uh, that be? And oh, and also a clarification for res oh we'll go. we'll we'll move to this later. Start with this question and maybe I dare address this as um, the first comment I would make is looking at how the banks trade in a multiple sense today in Greece may also and maybe it's, it's a strong word I'm going to use but may even be relevant at this point a because of the significant macro risks still ahead at least in investors' perspectives, but I think more importantly, in a point that covered, was covered before, because the very thin liquidity in the trading of the, of the stocks. So um, I think the, the valuation we see today is a valuation that is not driven by the fundamentals, at least to, to, uh, that's my perspective. Um, it's mostly driven by, as I said, the, the sentiment, the market sentiment, the macro sentiment, and also um, the big institutional investors, given the very thin volumes, it's very hard for them to take a position um, or adjust positions according to the fundamentals. So that, that, I think that's one key fundamental um, factor. I think maybe maybe uh, you know another attempt here uh, in terms of in terms of the actual price to book multiple. You know it has a bit contracted, but it hasn't really changed that much compared to uh, where it, you know where the where the recapitalizations happened and simply. The weight of the of the capital that was sort of taken on board had just sort of um, resulted in in fairly in fairly low um, price to book multiples uh, around 0 0.3 times book, and um, you know some I would say at least three of the four banks are trading, you know maybe slightly below that, but it has not it has not that substantially changed relative to to their book values. I think what we are seeing here is number one, what was said before return of equity versus price to book. That's still a regression that holds um, within the banking sector as the key as the key valuation metric. Um, and when we actually look at the Greek banks, you know, compared to other banking sectors in uh, in Europe, but also in in in, in, in Central Eastern Europe, um, actually uh, and we draw a regression line of the valuation of the of of these banks price to book versus return on equity. It's interesting that Greece is at the, at the bottom left corner, but it is still trading at a premium to where it should trade relative to its profitability expectation. So it still hasn't, you know, has not fully re-rated relative to the prof profitability expectation that's within the, uh, within, within the stock. Um, and it still trades at a slight premium to, to at least the theoretical line of trading. Now, uh, maybe a second explanation on, on, on the valuation, uh, which I think is very important in that context. Um, I think whenever there's uncertainty, um, you know, the higher risk assets are being sold off first. And I think what I said in the beginning about, you know, the high proportion of um, um, uncovered, um, uncovered non-performing assets, I think that ultimately intru introduces significant risk. And that significant risk reflects, is reflected in the discount. Does Greece trade completely decoupled from other peripheral banking markets? No. I think when we look at 
you know, the 0 0.3 versus maybe 0 0.5 in other markets. You know, you can buy some very large uh, European banks, I have to say. Uh, um, not, not to mention the name now, not to, I don't think we have anybody from that bank on the, on the panel, but I mean, they trade at 0 0.3 times book as well. Yeah, you can buy today um, a very large global, uh, global in investment bank at about the same price to book multiple. I, th I think we've just seen a massive re-rating of the financial stocks because they are the most riskiest asset and the highest beta asset in the market. Thank you, Alex. So not a buy recommendation then. <laughs> Can weigh in on this on this question or before opening the floor, just a, 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 a clarification from Reza. So, so you're saying uh, the weakness in, in the in the banking sector in Europe is just a, a it's just a, 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 a due to to low growth rates and that's it. It's not some sort of. Uh, 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 central bank induced uh, distortion um, and uh, an outcome of the you know negative interest rates environment that we're living in is just that growth is low banks aren't making that much money so their shares are not doing very well so and that's it so a simpler story that what we've been hearing lately I think, I think you have probably simplified it too much but uh, um, I think at the crux of the matter is the low growth, but I think then you have to ask why do you have low growth? And uh, then you do have the question of policy also comes into it, including policies on banking sector, both in terms of supervision, in terms of aggression of uh, MPL resolution. Uh, clearly the MPL, MPL problem is a byproduct of low growth, um, and the crisis that we have had, but as I also tried to indicate, uh, addressing that issue aggressively also helps growth. <coughs> and so, <coughs> excuse me, you could say policy has not been adequate on that front. Right. I open the floor to questions. Ah, okay, okay. Mr. Hardubelis. I have a question for Alex, because I, I heard something I hadn't thought about, which you mentioned that the buyers of the NPLs have a higher cost of equity vis-a-vis -vis the, so that they're not, they're not, so you don't want to, so the best way to deal with the NPLs is not really to get rid of them, sell them, but service them. So I was wondering whether you could expand on this notion of servicing. What does it really mean in, in real life? Sure. And and you know this was obviously a um, you know a, a general comment. Um, you know taking taking into account that a lot of the buyers of the MPLs are you know international alternative asset managers, and they, they should have a higher cost of capital than than the banks uh, that ultimately sell them. And I think what does it mean to service them? I think ultimately it means that you know you maximize uh, the recovery value through a number of strategies. Yeah? One is to um, you know clearly depending on whether this is a, a collateralized loan or a non-collateralized loan. You know it depends on either sort of the way how you um, 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 how you um, you know um, get in contact with the customer. Try try to get uh, uh, get 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 various motivational strategies uh, employed uh, for them to actually, you know, pay or, or find a way of a, of a repayment plan, a rescheduling, etc. cetera. Um, or in the case of, um, of collateralized uh, loans, um, you know, ways to, to recover value from, from the asset and the collateral. I think uh, whenever we have employed these strategies, and I think, you know, my institution, like many of the other banks, had also you know the pleasure of uh, of being affected uh, severely by the by the banking crisis. I think we have set up a very specific non-core unit within within our bank at the time that has significantly worked. You know, separated from the front end, from the normal customer-facing uh, executives who clearly had 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 relationship to these customers, 
so that, that non-core unit had sort of a separate management and separate um, strategies to recover the value for the loans. And it was actually quite successful because on the one hand, we, we sold down a lot of the assets, so reduced uh, the overall asset volume that, that City Holdings had at the time. Um, on the other hand, I think we were able to employ strategies to recover more of the collateral value than if we had, had left the loan in the, in the hands of the, of the loan officer or the relationship banker who actually had the relationship with the customer. Yeah? So there are ways to, uh, uh, to improve that. And you know, in some cases, you, know, you, you see situations where, where private equity firms or specialized servicing firms you know, take a stake in such, in such ventures. <laughs> Um, which is clearly one way of, of, of doing so and one way of, you know, instilling a little bit more discipline as, as you might have normally in an organization. Um, so that, that has been seen as quite a helpful strategy. Um, I personally think it's, it's the better way to, to create value out of the MPL problem of the Greek banks than just, you know, doing here a, a, large, a large number of, uh, of, of MPL sales and just try to reduce the ratio by, uh, by massive sell-offs because I don't think that's, I don't think that's, uh, you know, that, that will necessarily create the most value for the shareholder. Just to, if, uh, a follow-up. Follow-up. Follow-up to Aris now. Okay, G given the answer that Alex gave, I, I, I want to go to the regulator now. Uh, Perhaps you don't know it, but the strategy in Greece was exactly to do this. I mean, each bank has its own separate unit that deals with the NPL, and it, it's separate. Uh, so, 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 uh, the question then is, how come, uh, for three years now, we have done, we have sort of started doing the strategy that Alex is proposing, yet the system is stuck, and nothing is nothing is done with the NPL issue. What's wrong? What should we do? Or is there something more along Alex's lines that we haven't done? At first, I have to make clear that we're not the regulator. Uh, we're just a humble, uh, you know, unit trying to restore confidence in the market. And um, uh, well, I think I mean <clears throat> it, it's a valid point uh, to make. Um, uh, the way I see it, it's 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 more of a concept issue. Uh, you cannot ask people providing credit for the last 20 years in their lives, those same people to retrieve credit back from the people that they have been in relations with. They need to have a different mentality, different expertise, a different approach, different tools. Um, uh, and I think by, by having you know, independent services coming in the market, what you manage to do is you know, to, to, to inject expertise and knowledge in the market, and at the same time, to avoid moral hazard. It's a different story if the bank itself, A, B, C, D, going to the client. A different story is someone which is, you know, international player coming to the market, addressing the issue. Uh, I think it's more distant, so it's going to be more effective. And any kind of modifications or changes or, uh, you know, restructuring in place uh, can have a better impact than just uh, staying in, in the bank. And as I said in, in my introductory comment, I think it's, it's, it's very important, not per se, but the actual, be, be, because of what I have been described, but actually it's more important to set up benchmark in the market and uh, get the banks and to some extent the independent providers coming in and you know, uh, defend themselves and uh, evaluate themselves on, on those specific uh, performance, uh, you know, uh, uh, benchmarks and criteria. Uh, Reza wants to weigh in. I think you're raising a very interesting issue here, and I cannot resist the temptation but to come in. And uh, this is an issue on which my views have evolved since I was in the public sector and, uh, and uh, now having seen some of the practice in the private sector. The, um, and the, my background on this goes back to the Asian crisis, the, you know, the, the last severe global crisis we saw where NPLs went up a lot. And uh, you know, so, so the, the, 
experience since then in the public sector or, or at the IMF where I was, uh, the mantra was there are different ways of resolving this. It can be done through an AMC, it can be done on balance sheet, but a lot depends on the governance structure, on the policy momentum, and on willingness of the political system to accept change. And so there is not a, you know, the mantra was there is not a simple way, there is not a prescribed way on balance sheet, off balance sheet, or different countries have succeeded in different ways, but also different countries have failed in both tracks. What, what I've seen uh, since I went to the markets is something, uh, I saw the Irish uh, example and to some extent the Spanish example, and I, sort of my views have evolved somewhat, and let me, let me explain why. Um, I think sometimes it is m easier for a resolution to be reached when the assets are outside the bank. Why? Because the bank has rules, different clients who would demand the same treatment. Therefore, if it is not on your balance sheet, it is diff easier to basically give a different treatments to different people, resolve it, and put it back into the bank. So I saw that work. Uh, into, uh, in, the, in the Irish case. And I also what I saw was the initial recovery values were pretty low, and so it created political heat. So the system has to be able to take that heat. And then later on, the recovery values went up and up. And uh, this was the part of what I was saying, that the, the recovery and resolution of NPLs reinforce each other. If, if you do them. So I think taking into account the politics of the situation and the size and the difficulties, you know, I can see why people have different views, uh, but I think there is something to be said to separate the politics. Ms. Xafa. A question for Mr. Xenophos. Can you guide us through the trade-offs involved in the modalities of the recapitalization? Uh, specifically, what were the trade-offs between trying on one hand to minimize state aid and on the other minimizing the dilution of existing shareholders? So after banks tried to raise as much as possible from private investors, after the equity offering and after the bonds were converted to equity, any residual capital needs were uh, filled through the Hellenic Financial Stability Fund uh, through COCOS on one hand and through equity on the other. COCOS to equity, 75%, 25%. Who decided on these proportions and on what basis? Well, <clears throat> decided on what basis it's a very difficult question by all means and believe me that I mean being an outsider I'm not referring to you I mean I'm referring to the market that looking on the latest recap and on the terms of the recap believe me you cannot imagine night and numerous discussions we had with the banks with the Commission with the Bank of Greece, with all stakeholders, in order to make sure that we have a framework that will minimize the state aid, because that is translated effectively in minimizing the Greek debt and eventually minimizing the burden to the taxpayer. But at the same time, we need to make sure that we attract uh, private investors in a very challenging period of time. Let me remind you that um, the review has been open and still is. Um, the appetite of uh, the investors, as my colleagues have shared with us, have been rather poor. And um, there has been uh, uh, very uh, strong reservations if eventually we will manage to, to attract even the capital that we did. And just to take a couple of steps back, when, because we have to keep in mind that when 
we design the restructuring, sorry, the, the recapitalization framework, we do that without being able to identify the actual needs of the banks. In the beginning, there was that <coughs> you know, expectation, uh, rumors, you name it, uh, that um, the total size of um, the capital shortfall will be something like between 20 and 25 billion. So you imagine it's a different story designing a framework, a structure, uh, knowing the variables, and a different story by not knowing, and having to resolve and solve on the issues of attracting as much private capital as is, is possible, and at, this, at the same time reducing the, the, the risk for the state. Um, I believe the way we have designed that, um, it's the right way. Of course, for future will, uh, Will somehow prove if we are right or not. Uh, as we speak, it seems we are right in the sense that um, we have reduced the downside risk for the state. Um, we have managed to make sure that at some point in time we are going to take back what we put in the sense by, <clears throat> and I'm referring to the to the bond component on the cocos, because this is an obligation of the bank. It's not relates. The market conditions do not relate to, 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 to the depth of the market, it doesn't relate to the actual price levels of the equities, which has been you know, one of the issues that need to be addressed in the past. Um, and also, we need to make sure to understand that, sorry, to understand and keep in mind that in attracting capital, we have to abide to specific regulations and communications. Uh, there has been a specific guidance, specific communication by Digicom because we're referring to state aid and any state aid needs first to exhaust any kind and every kind of capital, of private capital. Um, because this is competition what it's all about. Um, and also keep in mind that um, we had to address that issue in, in a very short period of time because if we had delayed and we were, for example, facing that challenge as we speak, believe me, one or two banks have gone, would have gone in resolution. And you can imagine what would that imply for the Greek banking sector. So all in all, I think that we did well. Of course, future will prove ourselves, but I'm confident. <clears throat> Just a, a point, and I'll see if you have any comment on it. One needs to realize <clears throat> that there are three major constituencies in the banks. The one is the shareholders. The second constituency is the bankers themselves who don't want to lose their jobs. And the third constituency is the banking system and the Greek economy. My feeling is that the shareholders and the bankers themselves somehow colluded to make sure that the capital increases would be the minimum possible so they will continue to control the bank themselves. So my feeling was this third recapitalization was not adequate and the reason that it was not adequate was people did not want to have government entities get into their um, feet. I also, my also feeling is that the Bank of Greece supervision of the banks has been at least pitiful it has been very, very bad and to the detriment of the interest of the Greek uh, taxpayer. And that's why we have seen such very bad credit controls and such bad loans. And the big excuse, of course, is that we lost money from the PSI. Uh, PSI is only a fraction of the actual uh, losses. Um, so the question was, indeed, whether not another recapitalization uh, would be required. And uh, for Aris Xenophos, a question would be, as the Hellenic Financial Stability Fund is the shareholder, the shareholder needs to be much more actively involved rather than collect charge or see whether a recapitalization is required. Uh, you have to go and push the banks to lower their costs. There is an overcrowded uh, situation. There's too, much, too many bankers for very little job that they have to do. They don't make any loans uh, anymore. 
uh, salary levels have to be reviewed by yourselves, by the Financial Stability Fund. Because sometimes I sense that the central bank says it's uh, Frankfurt's role to do that. And then they say, no, it's the Financial Stability Fund who should look into the banks. The Financial Stability says, no, it's the Bank of Greece. I think you as a shareholder have a complete legitimate right to really keep uh, costs at a minimum, review credit control standards, ensure that the chairman of the bank have nothing to do with the loan making process, which is not uh, the case today. There's a lot of intervention. And this is something you should audit personally yourselves and not expect anybody else to do that job. Any comments on that? Sure. sure. Should you be more of that? <coughs> I think you raised a number of issues <coughs> correctly to some extent. Uh, what I would like to assure you is that, uh, as HFSF, we are very active. Um, and it's not because I say so. Uh, it's because we have put in place, probably you are not, um, it, it's not open, it's not commonly, uh, common knowledge to, to, to you know, outsiders, but we have in, in place uh, what we call relationship framework agreement with the banks, which is a binding legal document. And within that document, we have identified and, and make the banks committed on specific uh, deliverables on specific actions. Uh, those relating to cost issues, those relating to restructuring plans, um, those relating to the size of the network, um, by all means to a very efficient um, resolution of the NPL management of the NPL, uh, sorry, assets. Um, also, um, we are very active on governance issues. I think it's very sensitive to address the corporate governance of, of the banks. Um, it's very clear that as we stand now, there is a need to have um, a board um, and committees that um, would not only have the adequate expertise and the knowledge to address the huge challenges that were faced, but to be efficient and be, be, be proactive and be very decisive. And to that respect, um, we have a specific uh, commitment taken, and we are going uh, by the end of first half uh, deliver a review uh, on uh, the board of the banks and the committees, and um, I'm sure that as we stand now, uh, we're going to see experience very uh, strong changes in the management of the banks. Uh, I have to give a credit to the management of the banks that to some extent they have already initiated changes, but all in all, um, standing from the side of HFSF and having the luxury uh, of having a better picture on, on, on the full market, I would say that by all means, we're going to see changes, quite, quite a lot of changes in, in, in the financial um, market as far as the corporate governance issue is concerned. <clears throat> Thank you. Maybe I can have a point on... on, 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 on yes, yeah, sorry. sorry. Please, on go the ahead. Raising. I think, you know, I mean, without going into the details, obviously, you know, things may go, you know, extremely bad and, and, and you may end up having capital calls, but. But in the end of the day, I think what you need, if you need the basic stats, you know, Greek ba two of the four Greek banks at the moment, for instance, the systemic ones, are at 70% 70, 70 cash coverage against the, the bad loans, meaning, you know, effectively, the only thing that they are exposed, still, it's, it's the, this 30. Then you have, on top of the 70, you need to add the collaterals. The collaterals are after haircuts, after significant haircuts, because the haircut is effectively how they calculate their provision. So it's a, it's a test. It's not the reality. Uh, they are all around 120%. So, you know, and this, okay, it could go worse if, if, if the country does not normalize and you have MPL formation increasing, but, you know, as my colleagues mentioned earlier, MPL formation has stabilized and probably is going to start declining very soon. And, uh, and, and the other thing is that you don't have any other assets really that can cause, you know, such a big trouble in the Greek banks other than the MPLs and the deferred tax credit, which, you know, it's something that I did not mention earlier simply because, you know, it, it's a pan, it's a pan you know, European issue. I, the, if, if, if they want to solve it in Greece, they need to solve it in the periphery, uh, Iberia, et cetera, in Italy. So, you know, and ECB has repeatedly said that, you know, the deferred tax credit legislation stays as is for now. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, 
obviously you need to you can you can you can make a lot of assumptions, but I think the base case, at least you know, in my view, it's, is 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 the one I described. Yeah. Let me thank you for your crucial contributions. Um, I'd like to address my question to Mr. Uh, Mogadam, um, touching upon his uh, previous IMF experience and his knowledge on how IMF thinks and acts on this subject, and also to Mr. George uh, Triantafilou, mainly from an international investor's perspective. <clears throat> The Greek banking is inextricably related to the future of the Greek economy, which is also linked to the issue of the Greek debt. Uh, the Greek government is ready, hopefully after concluding the first review, to raise the debt issue. And uh, many Greeks feel that this is the fight that we have to pick, that this is the number one issue. On the other hand, there are many international commentators I'll not take the example of Japonica and Mr. Kazarian because they also have an interest on investing in Greek bonds and they say that the net asset, uh, um, that, the, uh, that, that the net asset value of the Greek debt is something like 18%. I'll take a recent uh, study of Mainz University, a German uh, study which was published in the Brookings Institute, which claims that the level of the Greek debt was 98% between before the second memorandum and something like 100 and 120 after the third memorandum. So the question is: Is the issue of the debt so important? Uh, on how investors see the Greek economy and the Greek banking system. Is this the number one issue or maybe reforms are more important for investors, especially those who want to, who want to invest long, uh, uh, in the long run, concretely, and on the future of the Greek economy? To say a few words. Uh, look, I think uh, reforms are also important. But uh, the, uh, the debt issue is important from one perspective, although I, I, I know from what you, what you said and what I know, um, investor perspectives uh, differ. But um, ultimately, the, the, debt is, the debt overhang is a, is a problem when you look at Greece and you want to uh, invest for the long term because as long as that is there, the, the prospect of uh, uh, not succeeding and having to deal with, uh, with an exit will hang over the economy. And also hand in hand with that is this drama that we have every three to six months of uh, um, reviews which may or may not succeed and at least take a lot of energy and a lot of focus away. Uh, so, and also it makes reform easier if you can, that can go hand in hand with some kind of agreement on debt. Now there are a range of ideas out there, but also I get the impression, it, not just the IMF, not just the Greek government, but also the Europeans realize this issue needs to be dealt with. The, the problem is the political sensitivity of this in some political capitals. Yeah, I guess to, to add to that, obviously, um, dealing with the debt would be helpful. Um, we don't really have uh, the luxury of uh, many long-term investors in Greece right now, which means that uh, while the debt issue is going to be, and dealing with the debt is going to be very helpful, I think that the investor community that we currently at least attract is uh, predominantly focused on growth, uh, macro stabilization. And going back to what my colleagues were talking about before with respect to NPL servicing platforms and so on and so forth, it is very important to understand that we have phenomenal competition as suppliers of NPL to the investor community. Uh, there is competition from the rest of the European countries. Um, these NPLs are larger. Uh, they're easier, easier generally to understand, resolve, and as a result, get a return on them. Um, as it was right, very well said before, also the investors currently looking in the country are investors who have a relatively high hurdle rate, and as a result, they will want to see uh, a return that potentially that we potentially wouldn't be very happy with. But 
In reality, that return can be caught in two ways. You can sell the NPL really low, or you can provide an outlook for the macro situation in the country that will allow people to, to actually employ a fairly aggressive business plan on the underlying companies. And I'm referring to corporate NPLs, but it holds the same for, uh, for mortgages and so on and so forth. So I think that, while I think that debt is very important, uh, I think that reforms that actually will spark growth in the country are even more important. Unless anyone else wants to weigh in, I'd like to bring our discussion to a close. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, I'm sure there, there must be more questions, but you can uh, discuss them with our speakers uh, over a drink. Um, uh, and, uh, Maria, uh, the president of the uh, Alumni Association, uh, would uh, like to say a few, la a few last words. After all these uh, optimistic views, it's time for drinks. And uh, I would like to, to thank once again all our sponsors and supporters, and mostly, and most importantly, our volunteers for their help today. Thank you.